Hi, everyone. Thank you for checking out this week's episode. I wanted to jump on and offer a small reminder of the ways that you can connect with us. The first way is our socials. So we are Men I've Tolerated Pod on Instagram and Natalie K124 on TikTok, my personal Instagram. And you can find us on YouTube and Pinterest under To All the Men I've Tolerated Before. The second way is by becoming a Patreon member. We are well on our way to our 25 member Patreon where we are going to unlock bonus perks to being a patron member. Shout out to all of our existing patrons. Um, As an independently ran and funded podcast, your support means everything. Another way that you can connect with us is making sure to subscribe and leave comments wherever you can so we can start reading reviews on each podcast episode. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. Make sure to check out the merch store and we will see you next week. To all the men I've tolerated before with Natalie Katona, the show where my guests and I chat about how misogyny convinces us you don't have to be nice to women for them to date you. <laughs> Today, Natalie New is back to discuss negging with relationships. Come along with me for an hour as I get to spend time with my friend talking about toxic relationship habits that society just kind of says, this is normal. Natalie, thank you so much for having me. I'm sorry if I jumped in too early. No problem. And I feel like as my Dungeons and Dragons friend, the first thing that I'm going to uh, disclose to you is today my party, because you DM, so you'll love this. My party adopted four more animals today. (laughs) No. (laughs) Oh, my God. We are Matthew Mercer's worst nightmare. Yes. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And any DM's worst nightmare, because yes. you have to roleplay as all the animals. <laughs> mm-hmm. Well, sometimes I roleplay as the animals, because I can't oh. help myself. <laughs> and I'll be like... That's fair. Eleanor, who is my owlbear, is doing this right now. And everyone's like, okay, that's what Eleanor is doing. But now, we have an owlbear, and then one of our players has a magical bag. And from that bag, you can pull either a large badger a regular badger or i believe a stag (laughs) is it like the gray or brown like bag of like creatures yes like yeah bag of tricks yeah yeah i think yeah i think that's exactly what it is yep and so we have three sometimes pets we've always had eleanor my owlbear but now we have i adopted a fairy dragon because that seemed like a good idea and we have a flower spirit, and we have a blink fox, and we have a baby phoenix. And she kept trying to tell us, she's like, you will all have to feed and walk and water your pets. And we're like, yes, yes, we will. And we've accepted that. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. So wait, do you do all of like the, the animal and the creature noises? I do. So Eleanor is a baby bra- uh, owl bear, and she's usually papoose to me. So I will do some like, and I will be like, and Eleanor is trying to be ferocious, and then I'll do a Rawr! <laughs> and like do this with my hands, even though no one can see me. <laughs> and I'm like ferocity, <laughs> ferocity. I'm bringing it. No, but I appre- I I think the DM would appreciate that, especially like. If I was the DM, I'd be like, okay, you can have all the creatures, but you have to role play as all of them, and I'm not taking any, like, I'm not taking care of them. So we found out that I can talk to the Link Fox, the Dragon, and the Flower Spirit, because I speak Sylvan. So she had a conversation with me as the Flower Spirit, because I was like, I took Sylvan for a reason. (laughs) Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. So you didn't even need, like, speak with animals. No. To, like, oh, wow. I was just incredible. chatting with our pets. I was like, oh, wait until Matilda just forgets that the rest of you exist. Because now she can talk to the animals. She doesn't even 
need to pretend to socialize with you. It's true. It's true. Well, and I, I've known some DMs that have even switched to like animal and creature based campaigns. Mm-hmm. It's just more fun. It's you just know? more fun. Yeah. But I, I was like, oh, we are Matthew Mercer's worst nightmare. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah. That's hilarious yeah. and amazing. Yes. I'm, I'm so here for it. And the reason why it pertains to this episode, because it does tolerators, is because over the week I belonged to a murderino like dating base Facebook fan group. And it was for my favorite murder and it's one of the Facebook groups. And someone was talking about how, like, a Tinder date made fun of them for loving their cats, like, and said it was a red flag. And I'm like, oh, what? I love that we still perpetuate this myth that if you love your cat, <laughs> you're an insane person and you're a lady who just talks to her cats and probably eats their food and never leaves your house. <laughs> Right, you just collect cats and wear big hairy sweaters and yeah. your hair's frizzy and you wear glasses. I think that's the stereotype. I mean, that is what I currently look like. <laughs> no, you do not. Yeah, no, Sunday is my not. natural no. day, so that is what I look like. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what your skin needs, though. Yes. You know, yeah. you do need a day off. Yes. Yeah. I, everyone took the stance that it was mostly a red flag that he was making fun of her cats and that he didn't understand why anyone would love a pet. And I was like, my stance is if you take the cats and the pet thing out of it, it is still a red flag because I took a moment of vulnerability to disclose to you something I am passionate about and you gave me shit for it. 100% and then made it a personality flaw that I have totally there's that and that's such a good way of looking at it it's so multifaceted because I think a lot of people get caught up in the fact like oh if he loves his dog too much he's gonna prioritize this animal over you in a relationship and so I could see that being taken too far like if you love your cats or your horse whatever um but I love looking at it from that perspective because you're weaponizing this um this characteristic about yourself Mm -hmm. that really isn't a red flag at all it's just a personality trait and then you're shaming someone for it yes you know like you don't even know that person what's going on and that wraps me all up and that's what negging is if you took the term negging and you put it in a nice little package or a haiku or whatever negging is literally just someone told me something about themselves and I've decided to react in a place of shame and making fun of and bullying and whatever because whatever they said made me uncomfortable and now I have to like rage right yeah. right yes it's it's an overreaction um of really just it could be anything you yeah. can neg someone literally off of anything and it's really quite an immature uh it just i guess it can become like a personality trait you can internalize it i guess and just like project outwardly but it can be weaponized in any way and i'm so tired of it and i'm so tired of negging being misconstrued as flirting it's like when he's not that into you opened up with that little boy pushing a little girl and she's like this is the problem we tell girls that this is love <laughs> and he shoved her right right and how immature is that yeah. like you are not taking control or ownership of any of your feelings instead you're just warping the situation and now you've made someone feel bad about it about you know? themselves about something as simple as loving your pet which you're supposed to love your pets or why have them i don't understand i don't understand that logic or i think when it comes to what women are necked about it's like literally things that are like quote unquote womanly hobbies like embroidering or crocheting or like gardening or whatever like if it's a womanly trait then it's like we will make fun of this right and there has been discussion recently and i'm sure you've kept up with these conversations about how misogyny and toxic toxic masculinity has really driven from an early age from the raising of boys at an early age how any form of femininity is weakness Mm -hmm. it's um complacency 
it really it's not productive it doesn't showcase any kind of real skill and that's entirely untrue a lot of these things too become our hobbies they become coping skills they become really important aspects of our lives and so if you take that and suddenly neg on it you know you're just negging the person for it um that can be really dangerous and to relate it back to when we were here last time talking about geek and gatekeeping and the geek culture i think that's why when i think about what was marisha's crime while she was playing keyleth besides just being matt's girlfriend it was literally that like keyleth at no point tried to be a badass or wanted to be a badass she was a druid who was thrown into a party and she's like i made everyone a flower crown because that's what made me happy in the moment and i think the fan base was just like well if she's going to try to do bad ass things you have to act like a badass and i'm like not everyone has to be a badass just because they're in an adventuring party Right. If anything, it speaks to, like, her multifaceted nature. If she goes and does this really wicked thing, you know, with thorn whip, and then she turns around and makes a flower crown, that just shows, you know, that she can be put in any situation and adapt accordingly. It adds depth to her character development. That's depth. But I think, like, especially when it comes to things like superhero movies or anything like that, if it's sexy and it serves a male lens is acceptable but if it is soft or kind or feminine then it's like this was a waste of everyone's screen time right i could not agree more and it's interesting too i've been reading i just got finished with like a cozy book which really like and it's written by a wonderful author i'll have to share the the link and the name his name is travis baldry i believe i'll have to double check that but it's like a low stakes book. It's about this orc or half orc adventurer who like retires from adventuring and she opens her own coffee shop. And the tagline is like, it's it's the dream. It's, the it's dream. literally, it's everything every D&D player has ever wanted, you know? And it just goes to show that you don't have to have this like white knuckle gripping adventure to have a really good storyline, yeah. you know? Cozy I, gaming, for instance. I was at my favorite used bookstore this week, and there was an entire board game, and the concept wasn't, you're not the adventuring party, you are the shops that the adventuring party frequents, and if you sell them the correct things, make a lot of money, and they survive, you are the most successful shop, you win the game. <laughs> Hell yes. yes. Hell yes. Well, and two, you could even break that out. I know this was in the context of a board, na- board game, but if you expand that further, you can go on to explore if you were to tell it as a story or play a character, you know, that was a merchant. You could go into the backstory of how these items were curated for the shop. If you yourself went to go get them, if you were part of the bartering. So you could really break it out into like a really fascinating, you know, engaging storyline. It doesn't have to be like explosions, you know, to be cool. It doesn't have to be explosions or jump scares or anything of that nature. It could literally, like, softness matters in this universe. And I think when anyone exhibits any sort of softness, someone in the room will immediately neg. And then instead of society going, that was a bullshit thing to say to the person who was expressing an emotion, You've been, like, trained to laugh about it and, like, pile on and do a bit and all of it. And while I love stand-up, I don't need every interaction of my life to be a stand-up bit where you're just one-upping who can make fun of the other person better. Right. And even, like, self-depreciating humor. You know, if you feel like you have to take that on and be the butt of the joke just so everyone can be satisfied, you know, at the end of it. Yeah. My least favorite form of nagging is when they're not even nagging you to your face i've been in situations where i've been complimented by someone else and a man in my vicinity will double down on that compliment and discount it and then make fun of me for something else and sometimes i'm like i have sex with you you think that you would want to be having sex with the woman that everyone likes but you don't. 
Like, (laughs) if anything, that could have been an opportunity to talk you up and be like, yes, the person I'm dating is a goddess. Mm -hmm. Everyone else should be jealous of my position because I am dating this beautiful, brilliant, you know, wonderful woman. And instead, it's just like, eh, you suck, kind of a Uh, thing. And it's like, she's a loser. And she yeah. reads too many books. <laughs> like, just because you've positioned yourself in close emotional proximity to someone doesn't give you the right to nag on them mm-hmm. in any way. If anything, it should be the exact opposite. We just get too comfortable in relationships, I feel. We do. And I don't think that as a society, we're taught very much how to be emotionally mature and to handle all of the facets that go into an emotionally based relationship. We all just kind of play act at them and then we bumper bow into one another's boundaries and try to find the happy medium. It's true. It's true. And that's if you want to work on it. A lot of times it it goes from bumping into each other's boundaries to just driving someone off the road entirely. You know, it's tough. Relationships are hard. We shouldn't take advantage of the people we date. That's that's really the main message. We shouldn't look at all of the things that the person that we like to date enjoys and be like, those are shitty, stupid things. And now I get to pretend like my hobbies are superior. <laughs> exactly. Well, and it makes me wonder, too, if, like, that's just a way for them to insert themselves in the conversation because they don't feel like they're getting the attention that they need socially. Um, another point to insecurities. I will say that the men who have nagged me the hardest are the, a subset of very insecure men that it is as if that because I got a little limelight, I don't, like you said, they were trying to socially awkwardly like also insert themselves into a conversation no one had invited them into or they're like trying to hold their own place within that conversation it's like a hey i'm here to move moment and it's like well no one forgot that you were there it's okay it's okay go get a beer or a snack you're gonna be fine it's so great that you pointed out that we are not trained how to be like emotionally mature that's not something they teach in schools along with communication and a, a, a whole slew of other things that should be in our curric- curriculum but emotional maturity would have pointed to in social situations where you feel like you're not getting the attention you deserve or feel socially undermined sit and wait the art of waiting and just listen to the conversation because always there will always be a moment where you can chip in in the right way without negging someone or you will be recognized by the other people involved. Yeah. And usually morons who I date, I am the person who includes everyone into the conversation. And I've done it for every insecure person that I've ever dated and or been friends with and or come across. We'll be chatting, 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 chatting. Someone will say something and I will turn to said person who's on the fringe of the conversation and be like, what books do you like? So-and-so, I I know you would probably love, you know something about this, you know, what do you think, you know, about that? Exactly. So I think that is an important thing to remind yourself that, like, because I'm also a bad waiter, or sometimes if I'm waiting, I'm really just scripting out what I could be saying. (laughs) And then I wake up from that, and I'm like, oh, we've covered three more conversations, and I would like (laughs) to circle back. Wait, wait, wait. Can we rewind? I have a really <laughs> great monologue prepared. <laughs> then they're like, if if the people in your social group are nice, they'd be like, yeah, of course, we can revisit that. That's and fine. usually when that happens, because I do that too, I always like botch it. Every time I botch it. And they were like, that was wonderful, Natalie. I'm like, don't listen to me. Just don't keep listen. going. <laughs> it's fine. Everything's fine. I would love to to circle back on like geek culture with that too, because a lot of like the men that we see in these social conversations um, haven't had a lot of opportunities to, to kind of go through and practice that in social ways. And so that's probably why you're seeing a lot of these insecurities come out, which we talked about in, you know, our, our last session. Um, But also too, it, it showcases an interesting part of like women in the geek culture where they feel like, Number one, they have to stay quiet and they have to include everyone and they have to manage everyone socially. And yeah, 
It's fascinating. Yes, it is fascinating when you're just walk and you're just like trying to make sure everyone's having a good time because if someone's not having a good time, they're going to lash out. <laughs> totally. Totally. And you're not responsible for everyone's feelings, but it right. definitely like comes off that way. Yeah. yeah. And that's yeah. like a byproduct of nagging when you are nagged or when you have been in relationships that rely on nagging. One of the things that you take away from that is if I don't make sure that everyone is having a good time, someone will come after me. And in order to avoid someone coming after me, I have to make sure that everyone is included. Uh, That's dead on. I'm sure uh, like I relate to that. I know so many people are probably nodding their heads right now. Just being like, yes, I feel so seen. Yes. And it's like, how lovely it must be to be that privileged gender that gets to just walk into a party, decide that they belong in every group and in every way at that party. And then when they don't belong, a gaggle of other people will make sure that they feel like they belong. <laughs> right. It's like artificially constructed to make them feel better. And so they, they get that through negging. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And it also, so I am a very anxious attachment style, which means, which means that there's almost like there's never going to be enough that you can do to convince me that you do actually like me because I've been net so hard or I've gotten comfortable in the like people like me and then something falls apart and shifts my reality that I'm like, I don't know. People like me today, tomorrow that could change. The world is unclear. <laughs> like, and it really makes it to where I don't trust my relationships reality after you've taken so much time out of our day to make sure you've made fun of me. Right, exactly. And I think just being raised with that mentality, that lack of trust, you know, that comes in as a survival mechanism, yeah. you've created this safe space out of the black and white. And you're like, it's better to just assume that everyone hates me and that I'm in the wrong and to overcompensate in every way than to try to work back and figure that out yeah. with this new social dynamic as an adult. Because yes. things change around you, but you carry that inner child and those insecurities with you your entire life. Mm-hmm. So it's so fun to watch me bounce from being an anxious attachment style to a, the other one is like the, I don't give a fuck about you. The detached attachment style where it's like, it's either I have to prove to you that nothing you say will ever hurt me. Or I have to like just constantly make sure that I'm three steps ahead of you and you can't hurt me because I've mirrored you. So you would just be making fun of yourself. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Have you found with that experience and like that boldness too that you're trying to emulate for yourself that it's harder for you to be your inner badass because you've cultivated that insecure version of yourself so much that it just kind of bleeds over and comes off clumsy or that you don't feel like you've conveyed yourself in a way for other people to take you seriously. One of the things that it's done to like change the way that I communicate with people is I'm an over explainer because I'm waiting for you to tell me that I'm wrong. (laughs) So I'll be like, okay, So I want to ask this person this during a meeting, and this should really be, hey, if I wanted to get ad sponsorships for the podcast, what are your tips? But instead it becomes this like storybook journey. And it's like, so I have this podcast, people listen to it. Sometimes they're women, sometimes they're not. And I was thinking, huh, podcasts make money. My favorite murder wrote a book and I'm just like talking you through it. And finally people are like, do you want to write a book? Do you want to have fans? What? I, and they're like, I've lost the question. I was like, of course you've lost the question. I felt like I had to sound smarter than the question actually is and explain why you're even meeting me. Like, <laughs> Totally. I feel like there have been books written about that very thing too. And it just kind of attacks like the surface level where they're like, less is more yeah simplify your oration kind of a thing and so they make 
so much money off of these books that just scratch the surface of really where that actually stems from the beginning the roots of it you know no one talks about the shame that's involved you know and developed over time and like the history that goes along with it because i'm sure when i was three years old i was just living a simple lifestyle and i was just saying i want a chocolate chip cookie and that being it but now as a 33 year old who has had 30 years worth of shame and guilt and nagging and gaslighting it's like well you know a chocolate cookie could be good but um, sometimes I eat sugar cookies. And like, do you have ice cream? Because I like ice cream sundaes with cookies on them. And people are like, I have this brownie to offer you. Will you take the brownie? And you're like, yes, I have no opinions and no thoughts on anything. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. Yes. And, you know, there's, there's positive and negatives to that. You know, like when considering options, it, it, I think it's helpful to be flexible you know, and not so rigid and being able to adapt, you know, I think that's important. But without all of the negativity that was attached to that, that like, influenced you learning that and really was beat into you. And that was like, it's like, could I have learned this lesson in a different way that didn't give me all this trauma? <laughs> Couldn't my, I don't know, inner child have a break? We're watching, my friend Jules and I are doing a live show every Tuesday about the time traveler's wife on Instagram. Because I read that book when I was 15 years old, and it was peak romance for me. I was like, oh, a grown man shows up in your backyard when you're a child and goes, good news, child, in the future, we're married. And it's already done. I love that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It's the idea of having everything being taken care of. Mm -hmm. You're like, great. I don't have to worry about it because I was exactly, I was the same way. I was like, I want that security mm -hmm. later on. Yes. And then it's the fact that he's like, uh distinguished 41 year old like library professor man with salt and pepper hair so you like as a 6 to 14 year old you're like I feel really safe with you and it was peak romance for me that is so dangerous I'm aware <laughs> and that is what we're unpacking every Tuesday night and guess who is show running the writing for the show our number one public enemy Stephen Moffat he ruined Doctor Who Okay, so wait, is are they making it into a show then? Yes, so HBO made okay. it into a mini series. It's a six part mini series. Okay. We have spent four out of six episodes with Claire as a nineteen year old when she finally meets the man who was time traveling to see her when she was a kid, and now they're dating. I need you to know that the book is called The Time Traveler's Wife, meaning it's supposed to be about her. It's her story coping with being married to a man who lives outside of time because he like poofs to different anchor points in his timeline and he has no control over it. It's not like he created a machine or anything. Okay. He has a genetic defect. So it's wow. supposed to be about her, <laughs> but a majority of the book was about their marriage in her upper twenties and mid thirties and her coping with that. We're on episode four out of six, and we haven't seen them married yet. And I went, oh, we've taken all the conflict out of this story, and now it's just fluffy, and you should believe that yeah. this is how fun it is for her. <laughs> mm, yeah, that sounds riveting. Mm -hmm. um, sounds like a therapy sesh yeah. for everyone. <laughs> I yell every Tuesday on Instagram, I log on and my friend Jules was like so how was it and I was like fuck you Stephen Moffat I deserve compensation I deserve compensation twice for Doctor Who and now this <laughs> yes yes and you are entitled to that yes yes I am entitled yeah. to compensation reparations from for media disappointment <laughs> Stephen Moffat ruining anything and everything I could ever love but yeah <laughs> One of the fun things about being a time traveler with a genetic defect is that you have a raging sex drive paired with a temper <laughs> that's supposed to come oh, off as no. sexy. So he's constantly like telling her that the way that she's feeling and thinking about the time travel or their marriage or him is incorrect. And I'm like, oh, this is cute. 
be so gross. <laughs> <laughs> this is so romantic. You and you fantasize about these things as a as a kid. Uh-huh. Twilight for everyone. Twilight, yes. right? And then you grow up, and then you're in your twenties and thirties, and you're like, there are red flags mm-hmm. all over the place. Like, and it's funny too because for Twilight. An adult, a grown ass woman yes. wrote that book yes. and fantasized that that was the ideal relationship. And it's um it's amazing to me that so many people, especially young girls, but older women too, all caught on to that and they were like, Yes, yes. He would sacrifice everything for me. Like it's like, okay, that I mean, he's not abusing you, but that also was a red flag. Right. Like we no, there's no balance here. I, so we did a whole episode on Twilight and how irresponsible it was for us all to be able to read it. <laughs> and it's so true. I was like, it was one permission. thing when you read the line, you're like my own brand of heroin. I was like, cause you can read it and it's a little sultry and you're like, fuck yeah. I've waited my entire 15 years for someone <laughs> to be addicted to me. <laughs> oh my God. I read that line and I was like, Oh, no. I was like, that was almost there, but it wasn't. And she rolled with it anyways. She rolled with it anyways. I would have edited it out. And then you watch Rob Pattinson say it, and you're like, no man should ever say that to a woman. No man should say that. Because he's also using it as a reason to not date you. It's not like you're so enamoring to me that I couldn't help but ask you out. It's like, you're my heroine and that way I have to deny myself you. And it's like, cool. (laughs) Right. How is that supposed to make her feel? Like, there is so much gaslighting and emotional manipulation that goes on in that relationship. Like, oh, I'm in love with you. I'm obsessed with you. But no, I shan't pursue you. Like, it's so dramatic. And so much back, like, the the emotional whiplash. So, I'm convinced that all of the literature that we read when we were teenagers reflected the gaslighting and grooming that the generation before had experienced and decided was romance in their minds. So, they were like, this is romance. They groom you a little, and then they make you believe a whole bunch of things are true, and then you marry them, and then it kind of falls apart from there. (laughs) But... yeah. The bar is in hell. Mm-hmm. The bar is <laughs> the in The bar hell. is in hell. Yeah. This is why we can't have nice things. Nothing is sacred anymore. Nothing is sacred anymore. And we talk a lot about grooming on our Instagram live show. And then I started joking about it because I love a good bit. And my friend Jules had to make an announcement to Instagram. She goes, um, because I was, the time traveler cheats the lottery. And I was like, well... You're going to groom me by the time I was six years old. At least make sure that I'm rich and I never have to work when I'm a (laughs) grown-up. And someone wrote in the comments, groomed by the 1% only, please. And I wept because it was a really great joke. (laughs) That is optimal. That is peak humor right there. But it's so true. And it's so sad that for so long women have had to like use that as like the saving grace in their marriage if everything else sucks at least i'll be rich right Right? bar is in hell jules was like we understand that grooming is a problem and is an unhealthy dynamic and and i went but as a woman who's been groomed by a lifeguard this is how i'm choosing to cope and get my compensation (laughs) as a lifeguard I feel like that's fair. I don't know if I've actually told the lifeguard story on the podcast, but I was groomed when I was 13 years old by a 28 year old who made me feel like I was the most important woman on the earth. And it made me feel very sexy and mature and like, not like the other girls. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh. A 15 year. That is so messed. Yeah. That guy should be in prison. Yeah. He should be in prison. Yeah. You were 13. I was 13, if I even was 13. And we went to a water park every day of summer because we had a pass and my mom had to do something with us. <laughs> and you were like barely a teenager and this creepy ass pedophile. And that man, instead of eventually going to prison, uh, started lifeguarding at schools no yeah he has a criminal record Mm -hmm. i would bet yeah 
Yeah. Facts. Straight facts right there. If he doesn't have no, it now, he'll have it soon. <laughs> okay, if... I can't imagine that there would be anyone younger than 25 years old listening to this podcast, but if you have children <laughs> who are listening, oh my gosh, keep them away from adult I, men. Yeah, <laughs> from adult men, who you don't know. That's, yeah. Uh, Especially lifeguards. Yeah. Especially men in positions where children are involved. We've seen that. Also, Teachers. he used negging to groom me, too, because he would tease me. <laughs> And then I would be like, it's love. <laughs> He's so mature. He's so mature. Oh my and gosh. He like, sees my maturity too, and it's wonderful. <laughs> we just get each other. We just get each other. He showed me his nipple piercing before anyone else. I mean, 28 years old as a lifeguard, has a nipple piercing, <laughs> hits on 13 year old girls. I mean, this guy, he's he's a winner. He was also Obviously. one of those stilt performers in all of our neighborhood parades. <laughs> the talents that this man had. I hope this man is in therapy. <laughs> I am praying. I also hope he's behind bars. I hope so too. But there's just so much that goes into the way that women will go to blanks to misconstrue everything that's happening in their reality so they don't have to go this isn't a good situation for me <laughs> totally yeah with the example you just shared can you give if you feel comfortable with it can you give some examples of how he negged you or how you've been negged so that people might be able to sure. <laughs> relate to their own experience um so i am a chesty woman I have probably been some form of a D or double D since the boobs came in. And he would be at a water slide at the base. And if I went shooting down that water slide and then I would have to adjust my swimsuit afterwards, there was always a comment. There was also always some like teasing little comment about like wow you really got to watch yourself don't you or something like that that's a great example yeah. and also feeds into all kinds of things like body dysmorphia mm -hmm. it attacks your shame it attacks you know personal representation and as a child that probably greatly influenced right. you like and it becomes one of those things where it's like, am I happy that you're looking at my body or am I worried that you're looking at my body and you don't like it? Like, it's always that paradigm. But it comes off as safe because it comes in the form of a joke. And when you're not trained to recognize what negging is, you just play it off as, oh, he's just being funny. I can relate to that. It, I am already insecure about these things as a 13-year-old girl. Yeah. I feel so seen. <laughs> I feel so seen. Um, and think about how, like, often our society copes with humor for everything. So it's like, as long as we're all laughing, we're all happy. And then I have built in my head some sort of resentment towards you. And no one understands why. Because it's like, it's like if you laughed at it, you gave your consent to be made fun of when maybe you were just trying to mask how much you wanted to light the room on fire. Exactly. And that builds over time. A lot of times, you know, when you're younger, you put up with a lot more of it because you, you're fresh to the situation and you want to be accepted so badly, you know, but it takes a toll comes out in unhealthy ways i came up with this topic because i thought that this was the safest way to talk about the critical role relationship that you like the least <laughs> yes is that what yes. it is about him well okay so for those wondering what relationship we're talking about and keep in mind too i don't know the cast I don't know their relationship. And really, my opinions do not matter to their relationship. They could have a very happy, wonderful marriage, but it's just from what I have observed as a consumer on the outside. Mm -hmm. Again, my opinion doesn't really matter. So take that with a grain of salt. But I'm, we're, I'm talking about Travis and Laura. Mm -hmm. Travis Willingham, Laura Bailey. Um, and from what I have seen and observed, there is a lot of negging. Mm -hmm. There's also a lot of just straight put downs that don't come in the form of like the veil of joking it's just it's very reactive 
And honestly, I'm like, ooh, that that makes me worry. That makes me worry. And um, I don't know. I I try to separate my distaste for Travis with what I have observed between his interactions with him and Laura. Um, but I have seen in a few episodes, both um, like on camera and during like the Tox Machina episodes, um, there there was one where Laura asked him for something on the show. It was an iced coffee that he had. And she was like, can I have a sip of that? And he was like, no. He just straight up like shot her down. And it's like, dude, like, what? don't bring that on camera. And the way he reacted to it afterwards, and even the, the cast like kind of looked at him like, what's going on here? He just like shut her down completely. If you're in a relationship with someone and you need to tell them no, it should be discussed before it works up to that situation so that when you're on camera and you have to kind of mitigate the situation, you have other tools in your toolbox other than just being like, no, you can't. I hate you. <laughs> and I think, so the partner to how negging will make me feel in my own relationship that I think plays a part in this situation is when you neg your partner in front of other people, those people will either laugh with you or be like, that asshole doesn't like his wonderful partner. Exactly. And we have seen in so many instances where Laura Bailey specifically goes above and beyond, not only in the show as her character, but also for other cast members. Mm -hmm. um, and to see that kind of come out and that reaction, how he treated her. And that was just one instance. There was another instance on Tox Machina where she like bumped legs with him and he's like, don't touch me. And it was like, whoa, dude, like, again, like, and then the negging. I haven't gotten to those talks yet because I watch talks in a weird order. And it's usually when I know I can't focus on an episode. So I'll go to a talks of an episode that I've already watched to get to make fun of Brian Foster. <laughs> and to see Henry the dog. <laughs> like, All very good things. And we can talk about Brian too. He's not off the table. As you know, Brian Foster was the one I couldn't get on board with <laughs> because I kept looking at Brian Foster and I couldn't decide if his jokes were him actually to appreciate like I couldn't tell where his jokes fell I go your jokes either fall in this category where you are making these jokes because you are an asshole and you would actually like all of the attention on you and it wasn't until one of the live episodes where he came out in the tattoo skin suit <laughs> and oh came out gosh. of the duffel bag to, like, celebrate the fact that Ashley was going to be home more often <laughs> and make fun of the fact that she had been gone so long. And it was because of this one TV show and all of it that I was like, all right, Foster, I might get on board with you. And then he started bringing his dog to talks, which is all you have to do for me to get back on board with you <laughs> it's like top shelf entertainment if you have your dog in your talk show i mean that is i can't think of anything better it it adds so much depth okay but wait so like when he came out of that duffel bag was he making fun of how long ashley had been gone for was he negging her there was something about the way that he did it that made me feel like he was making fun of the show because I think by the time that that show was ending everyone across the cast thought that show needed to end like two seasons ago or something like I think it was one of those shows okay. that lasted longer than it should have so then I got the idea that there was like a running joke within the cast that if only that show had ended two seasons sooner we would have had her for a longer time or whatever because I do like Laura Bailey is the light of my life, but I do think that Ashley Johnson is actually the darling of the cast. I, I, okay. Wait, I don't know if there's enough time in the world for me to get to like every member of Critical Role because I have so much to say about each of them. But, um, and I want to point out that that's a great example too for anyone who's like, I neg, mm -hmm. I am guilty of this because I think all of us are in some ways. I am definitely guilty of yes. this. 
And so I have to constantly be aware and keep myself in check. So I don't do it because there's no reason for me to. I just lean more towards, uh, you know, the, the negative side of life, which is not great. Me too. It's a defense mechanism. Today in my D&D session, uh, a prophecy was read and there was a line that said something about an embarrassing defeat. And I asked our NPC dragon hunter who didn't do a great job at the battle. I went, do you think that's you? Do you think that line of the prophecy was you? And they were like, that's a sick burn. Nadley. I was like, I'm just asking nicely. <laughs> well, and it's a, okay. But from what you've told me about this dragonborn, he's an asshole anyway. Yes. He was, and sometimes you have to fight fire with fire. He wasn't even an asshole. He was a thirst trap that my DM tried to like throw at me to see if she could get my character to be flirty. And then he was so bad at hitting dragons and his only job was to hunt dragons that I was like, he can't be Aragorn because Aragorn would have been able to do this. <laughs> And also knows how to not nag women to get a successful and wonderful relationship. He didn't even do it with Eowyn, a girl that he didn't want to spend any time with in those movies. <laughs> yes! Whose soup was terrible! With raw chicken and bits of fat. Uh, I have, there are so many words. No, but it's so true. Like, and that's, we could jump into that. Negging a NPC as he comes out in the relationship with the DM, all of that. Mm-hmm. But it, I wanted to bring up, too, the point where Brian kind of positioned himself and was discussing that show. Instead of taking the frustration out he had on Ashley about her being gone, he instead dug deep. He dug deep and he looked at the source of that, which was really the show and probably the director and the producers involved, you know, that kept her for that much time like that's an important part if you're trying to pull yourself out yourself out of negging behavior you have to find the root of it because i think the question that always gets asked when you tell someone please stop making fun of me and please stop negging me and they immediately go well how am i supposed to be funny exactly literally (laughs) about anything else like oh so you don't want me to be funny no i would love for you to be funny but i'm just waiting for your jokes to land like And as a novice boss bitch myself, Mm -hmm. this is something I have learned. Instead of asking someone to, like, stop a behavior, it's better to just come up with a solution for them. So instead of negging me, let's maybe try doing this next time. And then you just, you pull the rug out from under them entirely. They're left wondering how they could possibly come up with a better comeback to that situation, which might be, well, how am I supposed to make fun of you if I do that? But that's, you know, it's a great opportunity to just walk away. Because let me tell you, there is a man on, there's two. There are two men on Critical Role who do make fun of every member of the cast equally. Their names are Sam Regal and Liam O'Brien, and I would trust both of those men with my cat and my heart and my soul. Liam had a cat in Campaign 2. That is such, yes, green light, go. When a man likes cats, and not always, but a lot of times it usually means they're a better person than most. And Talison is just a wonderful marshmallow. He's a high fae. I believe he's 3,000 he years is. old. I believe this, too. He, If anyone is wondering, the ideal men in Critical Role, I would have to say, are Liam and Talison. And Matt is a pretty good guy. I love Matt. Matt's a pretty good guy. There's something primal in me that would insist on destroying Matt because I feel like I knew that I could. And good on Marisha for (laughs) keeping that in check because she could also destroy Matt. (laughs) But she she keeps it from happening and that's some self-control that I don't possess. (laughs) You can see in everyone that like is on the show that they have done some deep work with themselves and the relationships that they have, especially with the people on the cast. Because number one, it would be very hard to play with someone like Sam Regal. Sometimes I'm the Sam Regal in a <laughs> social situation. Little bits of Sam Regal are okay. But if Sam Regal is your whole personality, we should probably talk. <laughs> I just know that if Sam Regal and I met at a bar 
at the end of the night, we'd have world domination planned out and we would be ready to act on it. We wouldn't even give it a night's sleep. We'd be like, and go. (laughs) And go. And the sneaky, most hilarious, uh, like, obtusely annoying ways. And glittery pink leotards. Because he already has one. (laughs) And so. Yes. I do love that Sam is entirely shameless. He will try anything. He will do anything. He will. And it's admirable. I love Sam Wrinkle. Liam O'Brien is the human personification of a warm hug. To the point where Jeff Goldblum is the only man on this planet who could render me speechless by walking into the room and trying to interact with me. <laughs> I love it every iteration of jeff no he is kind of neggy too though he has this aloof no he has this aloof personality where he's like i'm better than everyone all of the broken hearts in me love him (laughs) oh my gosh yeah that's a (laughs) natalie i'm worried for you during the news jurassic park that i saw on friday on a whim He's leading a lecture, and some woman is in the front row, openly, like, mouth-breathing, and just staring at him. And I went, look, it's me at the Jeff Goldblum. Like, they knew. They wrote me into the movie. (laughs) In in my mind, he's nothing more than a plot device. He's just there to be made fun of, (laughs) which is not kind on my Well, and that's Brian Foster in a bag. Like, I, I, and I think that's what also taught turn the tide for me with Foster was when I found out that he was the equivalent of Jerry on Parks and Rec and I always love the character that everyone shits on the most. I'm like, that character's the best character. That's why they shit on him. It's true. It's so true. And we know from Parks and Rec that Jerry is this amazing husband, provider, human like and everyone is just like blown away you know when they see his family dynamic when they see his home you know and who he actually is as a person i love that though because they those characters take so much shit like trelawney and harry potter she's the best she's the best so when they tell brian foster that he has to get back into his cage like i applaud every time i'm like that that joke always lands (laughs) like yeah the joke always lands Um, But Liam O'Brien, when he speaks, it's the equivalent of myself getting soft, loving, soothing circles on my back, rubbed on my back. So while Jeff Goldblum is the only man who can render me speechless, Liam O'Brien, should he walk into the room, or I like log on on Zoom one day and surprise he's there, immediate tears. Like, it's like your teddy bear coming to life, like just like immediate tears. And then I'm going to have to say, this isn't an appropriate reaction. You just happen to be my comfort person. (laughs) It's true. Don't aim to be the manly man. Mm -hmm. Aim to be the comfort person. Yes. That's not to say accept being shit on, draw boundaries, Mm -hmm. but be there for people in genuine ways. Because by the way, Liam also makes fun of the other characters in the room, like a devious older brother, but you always know that he knows exactly how far he can take it. And everyone's going to go home still smiling and having a good time. Right. Exactly. He knows his limits there. But I, back to Travis, I just, it worries me because a lot of like the straight heterosexual men that I see, especially on TikTok, because that's my main platform, they love him. They idolize him. And even some of the girls are like, he I would be rendered speechless if Travis walked in the room. Travis shows the most red flags out of every man in that cast. Like, people will argue that Sam is, like, annoying, but, like, Travis has a really short temper. He doesn't show up for, like, anything, and when he does, he does the very bare minimum. He negs on Laura in the lighter moments and then just shits on her entirely, you know, when it comes to more close quarters interactions. And he brings his dirty laundry to the table a lot of times and in, in his role play. So be warned. Be warned, people of TikTok. <laughs> I will say that now when we came back, so I am around, well, I'm gearing towards the end of campaign two and I'm devastated because I'm like, 
I'm not ready to live in a world where I can't turn on the TV and hear new things that Jester wants to say to me. Like, I would just like a daily message from Jester. <laughs> Jester is a goddess. She is a queen. She's everything. I, she's so funny. And if you look, I've been picking up pieces about her character, too. She's hilarious, but she's also super helpful and super kind. She leads a lot of the group in more compassionate side quests mm -hmm. than really any of the other characters. And that's just who Laura is as a person, yes. I think. I think Matt said it on Talks one time. He goes, we are seeing facet facets of Laura that I think she's kept hidden from us, but she's finally, like, through Jester, become her truest form. <laughs> And I, was like, I believe that. I believe it too. And I love her. And at one of the talks, Matt, oh, that's what Matt said. What was I going to say about Jester though? Oh, I am nearing towards the end of campaign two, which means that we have come back from the shelter in place and we're all on in separate tables on separate squares. And what I noticed, it was the first time that I thought, Travis does love this game because I could tell that when they came back, the initial reaction for him was, oh, fuck, I really missed this game. He was hyping everybody. He was excited. He added way more to Ford than I think he had ever done in interactions and stuff. And I was like, okay, Travis, maybe you got potential. Like, maybe you do want to be here. But I haven't watched a lot of talks. <laughs> there, and maybe, so I'm speaking from a place of, ignorance of naivety i guess because i don't know what went on or what was going on when he reacted in those moments i don't know if he had a really hard day i don't know if you know things were just shitty in life in general so i can't really speak to that as his personality as a whole and i think we're seeing in campaign three more effort from him which has been unique and i think just a really big growing experience um, over the last decade that they've been working on this, nearly a decade. So I applaud that growth. I hope he keeps growing. You have a 7.30 cutoff time. I do. And we enjoy one another. So we're going to do our, <laughs> our two traditions now before I don't let you leave. So okay. <laughs> what is your biggest takeaway living in a world of negging? What's the lesson here? Oh my gosh. I think I got two out of this, which is a lot easier from the lessons that I garnered last time from our last podcast. But the first one that is a constant reminder to myself is to never cast judgment too harshly or too quickly on someone. Again, I don't know Travis personally. I don't know if he had been going through some things. I'm grateful that he is more involved now but I am disappointed with that behavior and don't think it should be something that should be admired um, if you're not trying your best. And the second lesson would be when it comes to negging, there are ways that you can, instead of defaulting to that, you can definitely take a deeper look within yourself to realize what the situation actually is. If there's a red flag in your relationship or any toxic behaviors that you need to discuss with your partner that might be coming up in social situations like that, um, and to really look at reframing it instead of blaming and negating the other person. I think my biggest takeaway is the sit and wait. Because sometimes when a negging opportunity presents itself or when a negging hits me, I want to immediately react to that compulsion or whatever. But if I sit and I wait in it, there is more of a chance that I'm not going to laugh it off and send a mixed signal or light the room on fire, like just cast fireball like Caleb would. <laughs> yes. Be, what if I'm just going to go out into the everyday uh, atmosphere and be on Tinder dates and some idiot's going to say something I don't like and I'm just going to go fireball and just pretend, try to pretend <laughs> like I'm casting it. Fireball. <laughs> just a full 11. Right in the just, room, just try to snap their neck. <laughs> but yeah, if I too can just sit and wait, I will arrive at my true feeling, and I'll be like, "Okay, was that a malicious thing that someone said to me, or is it something that I've 
made people believe that they are allowed to hit on because I make bad jokes about it about myself and just like try and figure out the intent behind it. Is it my job to be the detective of everyone's brain? No, but I am a reactor. So if I could just sit there and be like, did it really bother me or did it sting in the moment? Because now I don't think people think I'm cool. Exactly. Well, and you bring up such a, quickly, you bring up such a good point too of the sit and wait being used if you're the person negging or if you are the recipient of being negged, you know, it can be used in both ways. And then what are you hoping for the future and the collective universe? I am hoping that we can collectively be better. As I believe I said last time, we need to be better. We need to constantly be stepping up, not to discount the achievements that we've done and used to get this far, but for people who are negging and being negged, you know, there are ways of gaining that security within ourselves, you know, in both situations so that we can arrive at healthy conclusions and build healthier relationships. I think my manifestation going forward is because I'm a comedian and I'm so damn funny. I hope you are. that thank you. You are. <laughs> I hope that I am operating in the world as a Liam O'Brien, where I am empathetic and caring and loving. And when I am throwing out a joke, it is not because of some ugly feeling that I have felt about myself. But it is, a, it is a joke that is based off of the mutual respect and love that I have for the people around me. And I think that's what everyone should encourage themselves to do. So I hope that I am a Liam O'Brien running into a Taliesin Jaffe who is 3,000 years old. Or I get to be wise Taliesin. Or chaotic Sam. Liam loves Sam. And I am running into Liam O'Brien's. because. I never want to live in a world without comedy and comedy is observational. So you build your jokes around the world around you, but I want those jokes to be built on a mutual love and respect for the world around you. I'm tired of roasting culture. Just finding that balance. And while I think both of what we said are important lessons, I would have to give more praise into being the Liam O'Brien in every situation. That's the lesson I needed too. <laughs> That's the shirt I'm going to wear if they ever do live shows again. I'm just going to be like, be a Liam O'Brien in a Sam Regal world. And Sam will yes! still love that. <laughs> you could say, like, be the Liam O'Brien and then on the back in a Sam Regal world. In a Sam Regal world. <laughs> wear this to Gen Con, please. I will. I'm going to figure out a way to do it. Tell the tolerators where they can find you so I can let you go. You're you're wonderful. Thank you so much for that. You can find me almost exclusively on TikTok. One day in the future, I'll be on other platforms, but you can find me on TikTok at New to You, um, where I talk about all things D and D. And then you know where to find us. It's Men I've Tolerated Pod on Instagram. That has the link tree. The show notes have the link tree. That'll get you anywhere else you want to check us out. So remember, tolerators, you don't have to smile through anything you're tolerating, including mean jokes that you were told were flirting. Smiles are for joy. Hey everyone, thank you so much for checking out this week's episode of To All the Men I've Tolerated Before. It's Natalie here, and I just wanted to jump on real quick because I have been listening to a new podcast and I wanted to take a moment to recommend it in case you are not done with femme forward misogyny busting content. So I've been listening to Fat Chits on Top. It's a body liberation podcast that features conversations with a wide range of folks who are working on aspects of making the world a better and safer place for all people. So if you're looking for content with adult film stars, BDSM educators, disabled folks who have shot adult content, comics, and lots of weed-centric peeps, make sure to go check out Fat Chicks on Top. They are listed in our show notes.